Hi, I'm John, the engineer Termel, and this is the third part out of four on the lead up to the 1979 general election when I started my 30 year political career. So, continuing the story. Then the bubble burst. I was on my second junket in a row to the Hilton. I'd won 5000 on my first all-expense-paid junket there and was quickly up 5000 on my second. The Hilton offered one deck in those days, which I could beat at about 4%, a very hefty advantage. I was betting from two hands of $25 up to three hands of 200 After a particularly great session and after a particularly great feast, before I could start playing again, a pit boss took me aside and said, Mr. Termel, we would appreciate it if you would restrict your action to the craft tables. I asked, why? You mean you don't know? I said, you got your fair chance to break me. He answered, no, sir, we have no chance at all. And that was it for the Hilton. No more wonderful complimentary junkets at one of the nicest hotels in Las Vegas. Even though I tried to better disguise my play at other hotels, the Sands Hotel's pit bosses eventually became hostile, and I noticed the words, do not invite, written across my file as I checked out. I knew that as long as no one was excluded from being the bank in blackjack, I could play it in Canada too. So I developed Eubank rules and started running blackjack games around Ottawa. But first I had to write to the Crown Attorney. So these are from my notes from 1979. And this was to John Cassells. And this was in 1975. I sent him a letter. said on Sunday, August 24th, and most Sundays during the winter, a group of friends and I intend to play Las Vegas-style blackjack in my home. The game will be played ranging from $1 to up to whatever maximum the banker chooses. The bank rotates among the players, and no player should suffer financially since he need never bank more than he can afford. My attorney, Mr. C.A. Fournier, has assured me that using this procedure we're not violating the criminal code so since i truly feel that what we're doing is legal and harmless i extended an invitation to the law enforcement agency in charge to visit any time to ascertain that all the above conditions exist this letter is to make you aware of my intentions and to allow you to present arguments against the game or conditions under which you feel the game is fair to all and acceptable to you with regard to the criminal code so if you would like to discuss the matter further, please contact my solicitor and arrange a meeting. I will make myself available at any time. And it's Mr. C.A. Forney, and I sent a copy to Inspector Zuko. And then I got an answer on August the 15th that said he notes what I say, and he's sure I realize that it will not be possible for him to comment on the legality or illegality of any planned operation. 1977, January 21st. Tonight, the police raided my game in my basement. They broke down the door when all they had to do was knock. There were at least 19 people, but only 14 were charged. There was only $160 in the box, but there was 2000 of my Vegas money in the safe. At 10.30, I heard a crashing sound upstairs and ran out the basement back door, jumped over the fence, and went to my neighbor landlord to call the police to report what I thought was a robbery. Then I called home to stall the robbers. I then learned that it was a police sergeant at the other end of the line. So it was not a robbery, and I had just called for more police. I called again, and he asked me where I was. I said I was not around, and I'd meet him downtown. From my landlord's window, I saw a player approaching the house. I ran out to warn him not to enter, just as a police cruiser pulled up to respond to the robbery report. Now this was a duplex. So here I was with no coat, and I had to explain to him that there had been a mistake, that there was no robbery, but a fight upstairs. I then mentioned that I was supposed to see Sergeant Keeter downtown and asked him for a ride. He said he couldn't leave his post, and so I asked the player for a ride downtown. He agreed, and we left. A second cop had pulled up, and neither stopped me as we left. We went to a restaurant where I contacted my lawyer, Nick Wolf, and asked him to go to my home to see what he could do for Steve Brinston, my partner. He also knew where to contact me. At 2 a.m., Nick called to tell me that they wanted me downtown. Two vice detectives came to pick me up. At the station, Keeler tried to, Sergeant Keeler tried to pump me for information. His line, you give us information, we'll give you information. I don't think they understand the gambling principles I'm relying on. All the foundings pleaded not guilty. The clerk in Castle's office seemed perturbed when he asked, was asked to copy the letters. One found in his answer to the ju judge was classic. If he's guilty, I'm guilty. If he's not, I'm not. Most of the found ins were dressed in suits. So the trial was before Judge Sherwood on June the 9th, 
And I explained how it worked. And then finally, um, on December the 10th, Judge Sherwood ruled I was guilty because there was equipment. I stood to gain since I was the most skillful and no other player chose to exercise the option to bank. As in all games of skill, the chances of winning are not equal for all. I was the professional. Anyway, the judge chose to ignore the nature and the rules of the game and treat blackjack like craps, notwithstanding his own statement that, quote, the skillful player, a rare beast in Ottawa and in Las Vegas, using sound computer strategy, has a possible winning rate. Well, the judge admits that the sole determining factor is a skill of the player, and yet convicts me because he judges that there are not enough other skillful players. Fortunately, the judge saw fit to mention that I was such a skilled rare beast, Maybe the police did not have to raid since they had a written invitation and he believed I wouldn't have suppressed any evidence. There was never any suggestion of dishonesty in the operation of the game. The judge ordered that my equipment be confiscated and levied a $500 fine. There was no mention of my seized money. Sherwood said, this isn't a case where you can say that I am not guilty because I thought I'd found the loophole. It was deliberate. They may well have thought they'd found the loophole, but they must have also known that if the loophole wasn't there, they were going to get convicted. Well, that's true in the case of someone who simply commits the act first, but in my case, I consulted four attorneys, wrote to the Crown and the police. What more could I do to ask a legal question without risking getting a criminal record? So, watch me go now. Um, anyway, it, I appealed. Now, on the February 78th, leading up to the election in 79, on the 2nd of February, within two days, the police raided Art and Moe's craps game and Harry's poker game. I got picked up at the raid at Harry's. I heard a bang and crash. It sounded like a raid, big noises. I had time to put my money away, open my backgammon game, and read a magazine before I reached the top of the stairs. Gentlemen, you're all under arrest, said the arresting sergeant. He was acting all upset like we were a bunch of big criminals. And August 31st, 78, bad laws make criminals we don't need, judge says. Justice Lamer bemoaning, bemoaning the gambling laws. But then finally, in September of 78, the gambler's beat law, say police. The important point the Rockert decision. Police forces across Canada are powerless to fight illegal gambling because of a recent Supreme Court of Canada decision, says a group of police chiefs. Organized crime is doing a flourishing business in gambling thanks to the court's ruling that a one-night illegal card game does not constitute a common gaming house, the chief said. Their comments were made in reports of two committees of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police released at the association's five-day 73rd annual convention. This ruling means that the police are powerless to act on floating high-stakes games, which change location nightly. Organized crime can now operate with impunity in this very lucrative activity. The case referred to was the conviction of Harvey Rockert of Toronto and four others on charges to keep in a common gaming house. Police raided an arena where a blackjack game was in progress and the men were fined a total of $7,000. On appeal, the Supreme Court set aside the conviction agreeing with Rockert's lawyers that habitual use of premises must be will be proven to establish the place was kept or used as a common gaming house. This ruling has made the gaming house section of the criminal code unenforceable, the chief said. This circumstance is particularly attractive to organized crime figures who will now expand their gambling operations with the newfound immunity. Hey, I wasn't even organized crime, but I was going to expand. The chiefs urged the government to strengthen the laws against gambling. Other forms of gambling and related crime are also on the increase because of a 1976 amendment to the criminal code which legalized slot machines which dispense only free games as prizes, said the chiefs. However, the police chiefs said there's a significant organized crime involvement in operation of pinball machines and amusement arcades, and so far only John Turmel in poker and blackjack and Harvey Rockard. So, on the night in September, I was my appeal, and the Ontario Court of Appeal dismissed my appeal against conviction. Their decision said that the, uh, but the appeal against sentence was allowed, and it was varied to a conditional discharge with probation for a year. And then I got all my money back, too. So, good stuff. So I got back and I wrote a letter to the attorney, Crown Attorney again, saying that I'm going to be running my games again. And she again wrote back in October and said, well, we don't care what Rockert decision says. We're not sure. So if you're wrong, we're going to get you. And then so now I'm starting to run games around town. <clears throat> now, of course, the very first one was a screw up headline aced by devil booze. 
Unfortunately, I set up a game. I rented the Carleton University Faculty Club, and there's a section in the liquor law that says you're not allowed to run a game with a liquor license, so I had to run a funny money game. But unfortunately, that really caused shit to hit the fan, and I ended up losing my job. Teaching job loss to Termel, Termel the Turn full-time gambler.